<laughs> oh, welcome, friends. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Welcome along to another uh, spooky ghost story. Reading some gothic horror fiction with me. My name's Luke. Hi. Hello. Um, we are reading Casting the Runes today. It is by M.R. James, a highly respected author of <laughs> ghost stories. Um, known as the originator of the antiquarian ghost stories because so many of his stories are about academics doing academic types of things, doing spooky academic treasure hunts and the like. Um, Casting the Runes uh, is taken from his uh, uh, the, the second part of his uh, ghost story collections and I have read it and I think it is going to be a really fun one to read. Hello everyone in the chat. It's lovely to see you all. Um, <laughs> we'll check in with you folks in a moment. If you're new, I'll go over the groundwork. Uh, so, we read a uh, spooky ghost story. I read it. Um, I try and make it dramatic. I try and make it scary. Try and do a few voices. As far as my limited power of accents takes me. And uh, we take regular breaks to sort of discuss how the story is going. What we think is going to happen. Things of that nature. Uh, and yeah, we'll do our usual disclaimer before we kick off. Which is that uh, although we are reading these old-timey gothic horror stories, often the real horror are Victorian attitudes to things like nationality, sexuality, uh, race, um, mental health. Um, all sort of basically... Al almost everything um, sometimes these outdated attitudes crop up in these um, in these stories so it's worth uh, I think it's worth disclaiming at the beginning colonialism says Charles Snow yes really all the things says Sea Green 42 absolutely absolutely um, yes oh my gosh we've got a few um, super chats coming in Kaiser Red Darklight thank you so much he says I have burritos Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time on ga on GameCube and Mr. Westaway himself so I'm good thanks for this oh you're so welcome Ocarina of Time on GameCube as well is that the um, I remember that re-release is that the that's the one that's got the I want to say it's called Master Quest it's got like a, a separate disc or something where the did that is that the one that came with Wind Waker all right, I'm getting slightly off brand here because we're well, maybe on brand, but slightly off message because we're talking about spooky ghost stories today, not video games. Uh, Rebecca M says gender. Don't forget gender. Yes, gender is one of the many things to add to that long list. The science boy says, "Hope you are now recovered from the brutal game of Hawerwolf. I need a relaxing ghost story now." Yeah, if you were watching the Dicebreaker stream that I was on earlier today, that was a real good time. Um, so I have got a glass of port with me. That is slightly clipping through the green screen. Look at that, look at that cut glass. I'm just going to clink it on the microphone. Ooh, yes. Cheers, folks. Mmm. Oh, that's delicious. I love drinking port. It's such a serious grown-up drink that makes you feel like a serious grown-up. But it tastes just like syrup. Boozy syrup. It's amazing. Um, We'll kick off in a moment. I'll read a few more chats first. Gentle Mandrill says, Hey, oh, Luke, hope you've recovered from that last round of Werewolf. That was tense. But now for a spooky good time with Luke and MR James, it will be delightful. Excited for the antagonist you teased. Right, yes. So, I'm glad that you brought that up, Gentle Mandrill, because this story features perhaps the most hilariously evil antagonist um, that we've ever encountered in a story so far. Um, and I... When I read the story myself, I genuinely thought, I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep a straight face. I don't know if I'm going to be able to um, not make myself laugh when I read this. So, we will put that to the test. Um, I will do my best. This is a cool story, though. I, I really enjoyed reading this one. I think this one's fun. I can't wait to see what you guys make of it. I think it's... 
Yeah, I think it's cool. Fran Fry, good to see you in the chat, says, loving your hair tonight, nice curlies. I've got some cider, yum, and fancy goblet. Ah, uh, the fancy goblet is still here. That's got water in it because I do also need just occasionally to refresh the old pipes, you know? Mmm. Just to loosen them up a little. Okay, well, I don't see any point in uh, delaying any further, do you folks? I think it's time to read Casting the Rules by M.R. James. Here we go. Settle in. Get those snacks. April 15th. Dear Sir, I am requested by the Council of the Association to return to you the draft of a paper on the truth of alchemy, which you have been good enough to offer to read at our forthcoming meeting, and to inform you that the Council do not see their way to including it in the programme. I am yours faithfully, Mr. Secretary. April 18th. Dear Sir, I am sorry to say that my engagements do not permit of my affording you an interview on the subject of your proposed paper. Nor do our laws allow of your discussing the matter with a committee of our council, as you suggest. Please allow me to assure you that the fullest consideration was given to the draft which you submitted, and that it was not declined without having been referred to the judgment of a most competent authority. No personal question, it can hardly be necessary for me to add, can have had the slightest influence on the decision of the council. Believe me, ut supra. April 20th. The Secretary of the Association begs respectfully to inform Mr. Carswell that it is impossible for him to communicate the name of any person or persons to whom the draft of Mr. Carswell's paper may have been submitted, and further desires to intimate that he cannot undertake to reply to any further letters on the subject. And who is Mr. Carswell? inquired the Secretary's wife. She had called at his office and perhaps unwarrantably, had picked up the last of these three letters, which the typist had just brought in. Why, my dear, just at present Mr. Carswell is a very angry man, but I don't know much about him otherwise, except that he is a person of wealth, his address is Lufford Abbey in Warwickshire, and he's an alchemist, apparently, or wants to tell us all about it. And that's about all, except that I don't want to meet him for the next week or two. Now, if you're ready to leave this place, I am. What have you been doing to make him angry? asked Mrs. Secretary. The usual thing, my dear, the usual thing. He sent in a draft of a paper he wanted to read at the next meeting, and we referred it to Edward Dunning, almost the only man in England who knows about these things, and he said it was perfectly hopeless, so we declined it. So Carswell has been pelting me with letters ever since. The last thing he wanted was the name of the man we referred his nonsense to. You saw my answer to that. But don't you say anything about it, for goodness sake. I should think not. Indeed. Did I ever do such a thing? I do hope, though, he won't get to know that it was poor Mr. Dunning. Poor Mr. Dunning? I don't know why you call him that. He's a very happy man, is Dunning. Lots of hobbies and a comfortable home and all his time to himself. I only meant I should be sorry for him if this man got hold of his name and came and bothered him. Ah, ah yes, I, I dare say he would be poor Mr. Dunning then. The secretary and his wife were lunching out and the friends to whose house they were bound were Warwickshire people. So Mrs. Secretary had already settled it in her own mind that she would question them judiciously about Mr. Carswell. But she was saved the trouble of leading up to the subject, for the hostess said to the host before many minutes had passed, I saw the Abbot of Lufford this morning. The host whistled. Did you? What in the world brings him up to town? Goodness knows he was coming out of the British Museum gate as I drove past. It was not unnatural that Mrs. Secretary should inquire whether this was a real abbot who was being spoken of. Uh, oh no, my dear, only a neighbour of ours in the country who brought Lufford Abbey a, a few years ago. His real name is Carswell. Is he a friend of yours? asked Mr. Secretary with a private wink to his wife. The question let loose a torrent of declamation. There was really nothing to be said for Mr. Carswell. Nobody knew what he did with himself. His servants were a horrible set of people. He had invented a new religion for himself and practised no one could tell what appalling rites. He was very easily offended and never forgave anybody. He had a dreadful face, so the lady insisted, her husband somewhat demurring. He never did a kind action, and whatever influence he did exert was mischievous. 
Do the poor man justice, dear, the husband interrupted. You forget the treat he gave the school children. Forget it indeed, but I'm glad you mentioned it because it gives an idea of the man. Now, Florence, listen to this. The first winter he was at Lufford, this delightful neighbour of ours wrote to the clergyman of his parish, he's not ours but we know him very well, and offered to show the school children some magic lantern slides. He said he had some new kinds which he thought would interest them. Well, the clergyman was rather surprised because Mr Carswell had shown himself inclined to be unpleasant to the children, complaining of their trespassing or something of the sort. But of course he accepted, and the evening was fixed and our friend went himself to see that everything went right. He said he had never been so thankful for anything as that his own children were all prevented from being there. They were at a children's party at our house, as a matter of fact, because this Mr Carswell had evidently set out with the intention of frightening these poor village children out of their wits, and I do believe if he had been allowed to go on, he would actually have done so. He began with some comparatively mild things. Red Riding Hood was one, and, and even then, Mr Farrer said, the wolf was so dreadful that several of the smaller children had to be taken out. And he said Mr Carswell began the story by producing a noise like a wolf howling in the distance, which was the most gruesome thing he had ever heard. All the slides he showed, Mr Farrer said, were the most clever. They were absolutely realistic, and where he had got them or how he worked them he could not imagine. Well, the show went on, and the stories kept on becoming a little more terrifying each time, and all the children were mesmerised into complete silence. At last he produced a series which represented a little boy passing through his own park, at Lufford, I mean, in the evening. Every child in the room could recognise the place from the pictures, and this poor boy was followed, and at last pursued and overtaken, and either torn to pieces or somehow made away with by a horrible hopping creature in white, which you saw first dodging about among the trees, and gradually it appeared more and more plainly. Mr. Farris said it gave him one of the worst nightmares he ever remembered, and what it must have meant to the children doesn't bear thinking of. Of course this was too much, and he spoke very sharply indeed to Mr. Carswell, and said it couldn't go on. All he said was, Oh, you think it's time to bring our little show to an end and send them home to their beds? Very well. And then, if you please, he switched on another slide which showed a great mass of snakes, centipedes and disgusting creatures with wings. And somehow or other he made it seem as if they were climbing out of the picture and getting in amongst the audience. And this was accompanied by a sort of dry rustling noise which sent the children nearly mad. And of course they stampeded. A good many of them were rather hurt in getting out of the room. And I don't suppose one of them closed an eye that night. That was the most dreadful trouble in the village afterwards. Of course, the mothers threw a good part of the blame on poor Mr Farrer, and if they could have got past the gates, I believe the fathers would have broken every window in the abbey. Well now, that's Mr Carswell. That's the abbot of Lufford, my dear, and you can imagine how we covet his society. Yes, I think he has all the possibilities of a distinguished criminal as Carswell, said the host. I should be sorry for anyone who got into his bad books. Is he the man, or am I mixing him up with someone else? Asked the secretary, who for some minutes had been wearing the frown of the man who was trying to recollect something. Is he the man who brought out a history of witchcraft some time back? Ten years or more. That's the man. Do you remember the reviews of it? Certainly I do, and what's equally to the point, I know the author of the most incisive of the lot. So do you. You must remember John Harrington. He was at John's in our time. Oh, very well indeed, though I, I don't think I saw or heard anything of him between the time I went down and the day I read the account of the inquest on him. Inquest? said one of the ladies. What has happened to him? <laughs> Why, what happened was that he fell out of a tree and broke his neck. But the puzzle was, what could have induced him to get up there? It was a mysterious business, I must say. Here was this man, not an athletic fellow, was he? And with no eccentric twist about him that was ever noticed... Walking home along a country road late in the evening, no tramps about, well known and liked in the place, and he suddenly began to run like mad. Loses his hat and stick and, and finally shins up a tree, qu quite a difficult tree, growing in the hedgerow. A dead branch gives way, and he comes down with it and breaks his neck. And there he's found next morning with the most dreadful face of fear on him that could be imagined. It was pretty evident, of course, that he had been chased by something. And people talked of savage dogs and beasts escaped out of menageries, but there was nothing to be made of that. 
That was in 89, and I believe his brother Henry, whom I remember as well at Cambridge, but you probably don't, has been trying to get on the track of an explanation ever since. He, of course, insists there was malice in it, but I don't know. It's difficult to see how it could have come in. After a time, the talk reverted to the history of witchcraft. Did you ever look into it? asked the host. Yes, I did, said the secretary. I went so far as to read it. And was it as bad as it was made out to be? Oh, in point of style and form, quite hopeless. It deserved all the pulverising it got. But besides that, it was, um... Well, it was an evil book. The man believed every word of what he was saying, and I'm very much mistaken if he hadn't tried the greater part of his receipts. Well, I only remember Harrington's review of it, and I must say, if I'd been the author, it would have quenched my literary ambition for good. I should never have held up my head again. It hasn't had that effect in the present case. But come, it's half past three. I, I must be off. On the way home, the secretary's wife said, I do hope that horrible man won't find out that Mr. Dunning had anything to do with the rejection of his paper. I don't think there's much chance of that, said the secretary. Dunning won't mention it himself, for these matters are confidential, and none of us will for the same reason. Carswell won't know his name. Dunning hasn't published anything on the same subject yet. I suppose the only danger is that Carswell might find out if he was to ask the British Museum people who was in the habit of consulting alchemical manuscripts. I can't very well tell them not to mention Dunning, can I? It would set them talking at once. Let's hope it won't occur to him. However, Mr. Carswell was an astute man. Let's take a little break there. Wow. How about that? Kobe Morris says, pulse pounding book review action. Yeah. So we open with a whole bunch of reviews for this one Carswell's latest tract, which uh, sounds like it was absolute bobbins and got the uh, terrible reviews that it deserved because it was all about witchcraft and horrible stuff. Um, but I don't really want to talk about anything that we've had in the book so far, except for the um, horror slideshow that Mr. Carswell gave the children of the village in order, presumably, to stop them from walking all over his lawn. Because that was amazing and made me laugh so much when I read it. And I, I, I got through it. I got through it. I got through it. The bit that, um, the bit that nearly did for me was, um... Uh, was the bit where, like, the children are freaking out because the screen is covered in, like, centipedes and, like, horrors and, like, children being torn apart on these slides and stuff. And then, like, everyone's like, Mis Mr. Carswell, stop this slideshow. And he says, oh, you think it's time to bring our little show to an end and send them home to their beds? Very well. Very in very well is italicized. I hope that came across. Very well. <laughs> And then bam, centipedes, snakes. <laughs> anyway, it really cracked me. It really cracked me up. <laughs> oh, okay, right. I'm getting my laughs out now. Jimmy Snow B says, "Luke, I got my mum to listen to the Judge's House, which was a story we read before, and she got majorly freaked out by the amount of rats." Yeah, that was a creepy one. That was a real creepy one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, um, Jimmy Snowby's mum. Please accept my apologies. I'm sorry for the rat freak out. Ah, Nimbletack says that's a proper mustache twirler. Yeah, that's right. Ray Chick says Carswell, powered by spite. Yeah, that, that's about it. Jane Cluett says I love Carswell. He's so hilariously petty. The banality of evil, but with superpowers. It's a good description. Mm. <laughs> and Anthony Dunn says, loving the Spandau Ballet hair, Luke. Thanks, yeah, the lockdown hair is um it's fully out of con fully it's fully assumed control. Um Yeah. Yeah. It's starting to get sun starting to curl up, curl around at the edges. Enough so that I don't really want to do anything to it. I just want to sort of like leave it. Anyway, enough about my hair. Okay. Uh, all right. 
uh, let's read a few few more few more chats and then um then we'll crack on Adam Kellum says this is great it's the feeling I have towards my dissertation committee currently yeah 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 the um I mean look as we will read as we will discover and as you probably guessed from the fact that this is a ghost story there isn't nothing to Mr. Carswell's writings on the subject of witchcraft and the occult and his evil books. And frankly, regardless of how it's written, if you submit a book of magic spells and the magic spells work and magic is real in your book, I would expect every academic in town to sit up and take notice and say, well done. You have discovered real magic. Well done, Mr. Carswell. Yes, of course, my, my son would love to come round and see your slideshow. Claire T says, I mean, at least he's not posting passive-aggressive notes through his neighbour's letterbox. That'd be worse. <laughs> Mr. T Mr. Team Corbett, Dan in the chat says, one star, book is too evil. Yep, there we go. There we go. Okay, right. Enough, uh... Enough, ta enough tarrying. Let's crack on. Because we have just heard that Mr. Carswell was an astute man. And, dare I say, doesn't like to be criticised. Ah. This much is in the way of prologue. On an evening rather later in the same week... Mr. Edward Dunning was returning from the British Museum, where he had been engaged in research, to the comfortable house in a suburb where he lived alone, tended by two excellent women who had been who had been long with him. There is nothing to be added by way of description of him to what we have heard already. Let us follow him as he takes his sober course homewards. A train took him to within a mile or two of his house, and an electric tram a stage farther. The line ended at a point some 300 yards from his front door. He had had enough of reading when he got into the car, and indeed the light was not such as to allow him to do more than study the advertisements on the panes of glass that faced him as he sat. As was not unnatural, the advertisements in this particular line of car were objects of his frequent contemplation, and with the possible exception of the brilliant and convincing dialogue between Mr. Lamplow and an eminent KC on the subject of pyretic saline, none of them afforded much scope to his imagination. I am wrong. There was one at the corner of the car farthest from him, which did not seem familiar. It was in blue letters on a yellow ground, and all that he could read of it was a name, John Harrington, and something like a date could be of no interest to him to know more, but for all that, as the car emptied, he was just curious enough to move along the seat until he could read it well. He felt to a slight extent repaid for his trouble. The advertisement was not of the usual type. It ran thus. In memory of John Harrington, FSA of the Laurels Ashbrook, died September 18th, 1889. Three months were allowed. The car stopped. Mr. Dunning, still contemplating the blue letters on the yellow ground, had to be stimulated to rise by a word from the conductor. I beg your pardon, he said. Oh, sorry, I got the wrong voice there. I beg your pardon, he said. I was looking at that advertisement. It's a very odd one, isn't it? The conductor read it slowly. Well, my word, he said. I never seen that one before. Well, that is a cure, ain't it? Someone been up to their jokes here, I should think. He got out a duster and applied it, not without saliva, to the pane and then to the outside. No, he said, returning. That ain't no transfer. Seems to me as if it were regular in the glass. What I mean in the substance, as you may say. Don't you think so, sir? Mr Dunning examined it and rubbed it with his glove and agreed. Who looks after these advertisements and gives leave for them to be put up? I wish you would inquire. I will just take a note of the words. At this moment, there came a call from the driver. Look alive, George. Time's up. All right, all right. There's something else. What's up at this end? You come and look at this here glass. What's going on with the glass? Said the driver, approaching. Well, who's Arrington? What's it all about? 
I was just asking who was responsible for putting the advertisements up in your cars and, and saying it would be as well to make some inquiry about this one. Well, sir, that's all done at the company's office, that work is. It's, uh, it's our Mr. Tim's, I believe, looks into that. Uh, when we put up tonight, I'll leave word, and perhaps I'll be able to tell you tomorrow if you, if you happen to be coming this way. That was all that passed that evening. Mr. Dunning did just go to the trouble of looking up Ashbrook and found that it was in Warwickshire. Next day, he went to town again. The car, it was the same car, was too full in the morning to allow of his getting a word with the conductor. He could only be sure that the curious advertisement had been made away with. The close of the day brought a further element of mystery into the transaction. He had missed the tram or else preferred walking home. But at a rather late hour, while he was at work in his study, one of the maids came to say that two men from the tramways were very anxious to speak to him. This was a reminder of the advertisement, which he had, he says, nearly forgotten. He had the men in, they were the conductor and the driver of the car, and when the matter of refreshment had been attended to, asked what Mr Timms had had to say about the advertisement. "'Well, sir, that's what we took the liberty to step round about,' said the conductor. "'Mr Timms, he give William here the rough side of his tongue about that. According to him, there want no advertisement of that description sent in, uh, nor ordered, nor paid for, nor put up, uh, nor nothing.' Uh, let alone not be in there, and we was playing the fool taking up his time. Well, I says, if that's the case, all I ask of you, Mr Timms, I says, is to take a look and look at it for yourself, I says. Of course, if it ain't there, I says, you may take and call me off what you like. Right, he says, I will, and we went straight off. Now, I leave it to you, sir, if that ad, uh, as we term them, with Arrington on it, weren't as plain as ever you see anything, blue letters on yellow glass, and as I says at the time, and, and you bore me out regular in the glass, because, because if you remember, you, you recollected me swabbing it with my duster, to be sure I do, quite clearly, well, you may say, well, I don't think Mr. Timms, he gets in that car with light, no, he told William to hold the light outside, now he says, where's your precious ad, what we've heard so much about? Here it is, I say, Mr. Timms, and I laid my hand on it. The conductor paused. Well, said Mr. Dunning, it was gone, I suppose, broken. Broke? N not it. There weren't, if you'll believe me, no more trace of them letters, but blue letters they was, and that piece of glass. Then, well, it's no good me talking. I never seen such a thing. I leave it to William here. But if, if as I says, where's the benefit in me going on about it? And what did Mr. Timms say? Whoa. He did what I give him leave to, called us pretty much anything he liked, and I don't think I know I blame him so much either. But what we thought, William and me did, was as we seen you take down a bit of a note about that, well, that's lettering. I, I certainly did that. Um, I have it now. Uh, do you wish me to speak to Mr Timms myself and show it to him? What was that you came in about? Uh, there, didn't I say as much, said William. Deal with a gent if you can get on the track of one, that's my word. Uh, now, perhaps, George, you'll allow as I ain't took you very far wrong tonight. Very well, William, very well. No need for you to go on as if you'd had to frogs march me here. I come quiet, didn't I? All the same for that. We hadn't ought to take up more of your time this way, sir. But, but if it so happened, you could find time to step round to the company office in the morning and tell Mr. Timms what you see for yourself. Well, we should lay under a very high obligation to you for the trouble. You see, it, it, it ain't been called, well, one thing and another, as we mind. But if they got it into their head at the office that we seen things as weren't there... Why, one thing leads to another, and where shall we be a twelve-month thence? Well, you can understand what I mean. Amid further elucidations of the proposition, George, conducted by William, left the room. The incredulity of Mr Timms, who had a nodding acquaintance with Mr Dunning, was greatly modified on the following day by what the latter could tell and show him, and any bad, bad mark that might have been attached to the names of William and George was not suffered to remain on the company's books, but explanation there was none. Mr Dunning's interest in the matter was kept alive by an incident of the following afternoon. He was walking from his club to the train, and he noticed some way ahead a man with a handful of leaflets, such as are distributed to passers-by by agents of enterprising firms. This agent had not chosen a very crowded street for his operations, in fact, Mr Dunning did not see him get rid of a single leaflet before he himself reached the spot. One was thrust into his hand as he passed. The hand that gave it touched his, and he experienced a sort of little shock as it did so. It seemed unnaturally rough and hot. He looked in passing at the giver, but the impression he got was so unclear that, however much, 
he tried to reckon it up subsequently, nothing would come. He was walking quickly, and as he went on, glanced at the paper. It was a blue one. The name of Harrington in large capitals caught his eye. He stopped, started, and felt for his glasses. The next instant the leaflet was twitched out of his hand by a man who hurried past, and was irrecoverably gone. He ran back a few paces, but, but where was the passerby? And where the distributor? Let's take a break there, I think. So, we've got Mr Dunning, who you will remember, wrote a fairly nasty review. Uh, well, a quite fair review of Mr Carswell's work on witchcraft. Um, and now strange things are afoot for Mr Dunning. What a coincidence. Who would have guessed? Mm. It's quite a weird one, this. It's, um... I think this is odd, because it's not, like, classically sort of spooky. An advert. What sounds like a kind of modern advert. It's, like, blue and yellow. Mm hmm An advert a mysteriously appearing within the glass of a car window. Well, public transport car window. That was a tricky bit to read, you know. I can only apologise for the voices of, what were they called? William and George. What I would say is that that whole bit of dialogue, I did my best because it is written phonetically. <laughs> for example, the word office is spelled O-R-F-I-C-E, as M.R. James would have it. The office. <laughs> the office. Um, yeah. 12 month is spelled 12 M U N C E, 12 months. So, yeah, did my best there. Hope that didn't get, uh, hope that, hope that didn't, hope that didn't end up too, uh, Dick Van Dyke, Mary Poppins. <laughs> the problem is when you're doing, a, when you're trying to do a, that kind of Cockney accent, it's very hard to not picture, um, um, Mary Poppins, you know, like the D Dick Van Dyke character. Um, but, and then once that's in your head, suddenly everything starts coming out just a little bit. Just a, just a little bit. Uh, Charles Snow, um, oh, thank you very much. Thank you for chipping in, Charles Snow. Says thank you. Thank you, Charles Snow. It's very generous. Thank you. Um, all right. <laughs> Mujin says, at least there wasn't a governor. Mm, yeah, there. Uh, I wouldn't put it past him. M. R. James does not write uh, his um, non-academic characters very flatteringly. I think it would be fair to say. Everybody else is written. You know, this feels like the only voice you can do because of the language that they're using and the words and the backgrounds they're discussing, and they're all, all very fancy. But there you go. Sorry, I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying the chat. There's a lot of phonetic, phonetically written nonsense. Uh, the transient one says, I'm American. All of our impressions of English accents inevit inevitably turn into that. Yes, but if you're American, it kind of is an excuse because it's a very di distant accent from your natural home accent, shall we say. So that, you know, like, that's a free pass. Mm. Right. Should we crack on, folks? So, no explanation for this advert. And then, what should Mr. Dunning find but a leaflet pressed into his hand? Oh, nice comment from Irritating105. He says, thank you. Thank you, Irritating101. Thank you. That's very generous and very kind. Thanks. Right. So, Mr. Dunning has had something pressed into his hand, and he's seen this advert that later disappeared. And what was the text on the advert? Let's remind ourselves of that. It said, In memory of John Harrington, FSA of the Laurels, Ashbrook, died September 18th, 1889. Three months were allowed. 
you will remember Mr. Harrington is the one who was chased up a tree by something evil and died after leaving Mr. Carswell a bad review. It was in a somewhat pensive frame of mind that Mr Dunning passed on the following day into the select manuscript room of the British Museum and filled up tickets for Harley 3586 and some other volumes. After a few minutes they were brought to him and he was settling the one he wanted first upon the desk when he thought he heard his own name whispered behind him. He turned round hastily and in doing so brushed his little portfolio of loose papers onto the floor. He saw no one he recognised except one of the staff in charge of the room, who nodded to him, and he proceeded to pick up his papers. He thought he had them all and was beginning uh, to do his work when a stout gentleman at the table behind him, who was just rising to leave and had collected his own belongings, touched him on the shoulder, saying, May I give you this? I, I think it should be yours, and handed him a missing choir. It is mine, thank you, said Mr Dunning. In another moment, the man had left the room. Upon finishing his work for the afternoon, Mr Dunning had some conversation with the assistant in charge and took occasion to ask who the stout gentleman was. Oh, he's a man named Carswell, said the assistant. He was asking me a week ago who were the great authorities on alchemy, and of course I told him you were the only one in the country. I'll see if I can catch him. He'd like to meet you, I'm sure. For heaven's sake, don't dream of it! said Mr Dunning. I'm particularly, I'm particularly anxious to avoid him. Oh, very well, said the assistant. He doesn't come here often. I, I dare say you won't meet him. More than once on the way home that day, Mr Dunning confessed to himself that he did not look forward with his usual cheerfulness to a solitary evening. It seemed to him that something ill-defined and impalpable had stepped in between him and his fellow men had taken him in charge, as it were. He wanted to sit close up to his neighbours in the train and in the tram, but as luck would have it, both train and car were markedly empty. The conductor George was thoughtful and appeared to be absorbed in calculations as to the number of passengers. On arriving at his house, he found Dr Watson, his medical man, on his doorstep. I've had to upset your household arrangements, I'm sorry to say, Dunning. Uh, both your servants hors de combat. In fact, I've had to send them to the nursing home. Good heavens, what's the matter? It's something like podomain poisoning, I shouldn't think. You've not suffered yourself, I can see, or you wouldn't be walking about. I think they'll pull through all right. Dear, dear, have you any idea what brought it on? Well, they tell me they bought some shellfish from a hawker at their dinner time. It's odd, I've made inquiries, but I can't find that any hawker has been to the other houses in the street. I couldn't send word to you, they won't be back for a bit yet. You come and dine with me tonight, anyhow, and we can make arrangements for going on. Eight o'clock, don't be too anxious. The solitary evening was thus obviated, at the expense of some distress and inconvenience, it is true. Mr Dunning spent the time pleasantly enough with the doctor, a rather recent settler, and returned to his lonely home at about 11.30. The night he passed is not one on which he looks back with any satisfaction. He was in bed, and the light was out. He was wondering if the charwoman would come early enough to get him hot water next morning, when he heard the unmistakable sound of his study door opening. No step followed it on the passage floor, but the sound must mean mischief, for he knew that he had shut the door that evening after putting his papers away in his desk. It was rather shame than courage that induced him to slip out into the passage and lean over the banister in his nightgown, listening. No light was visible, no further sound came. Only a gust of warm or even hot air played for an instant round his shins. He went back and decided to lock himself into his room. There was more unpleasantness, however. Either an economical suburban company had decided that their light would not be required in the small hours and had stopped working, or else something was wrong with the meter. The effect was, in any case, that the electric light was off. The obvious course was to find a match and also to consult his watch. He might as well know how many hours of discomfort awaited him. So he put his hand into the well-known nook under the pillow, only it did not get so far. What he touched was, according to his account, 
a mouth with teeth and with hair about it, and he declares not the mouth of a human being. I do not think it is any use to guess what he said or did, but he was in a spare room with the door locked and his ear to it before he was clearly conscious again. And there he spent the rest of a most miserable night, looking every moment for some fumbling at the door, but nothing came. The venturing back to his own room in the morning was attended with many listenings and quiverings. The door stood open, fortunately, and the blinds were up. The servants had been out of the house before the hour of drawing them down. There was, to be short, no trace of an inhabitant. The watch, too, was in its usual place. Nothing was disturbed, only the wardrobe door had swung open, in accordance with its confirmed habit. A ring at the back door now announced the charwoman, who had been ordered the night before, and nerved Mr Dunning, after letting her in, to continue his search in other parts of the house. But it was equally fruitless. The day thus began went on dismally enough. He dared not go to the museum. In spite of what the assistant had said, Carswell might turn up there, and Dunning felt he could not cope with a probably hostile stranger. His own house was odious. He hated sponging on the doctor. He spent some little time in a call at the nursing home, where he was slightly cheered by a good report of his housekeeper and maid. Towards lunchtime, he betook himself to his club, again experiencing a gleam of satisfaction at seeing the secretary of the association. At luncheon, Dunning told his friend the more material of his woes, but could not bring himself to speak of those that weighed most heavily upon his spirits. "'My poor dear man,' said the secretary, "'what an upset. Look here, we're alone at home, absolutely. You must put up with us. Yes, no excuse. Send your things in this afternoon.' Dunning was unable to stand out. He was, in truth, becoming acutely anxious as the hours went on as to what that night might have waiting for him. He was almost happy as he hurried home to pack up. His friends, when they had time to say, take stock of him, were rather shocked at his lawn appearance and did their best to keep him up to the mark. Not altogether without success, but when the two men were smoking alone later, Dunning became dull again. Suddenly he said, Gayton, I believe that alchemist man knows it was I who got his paper rejected. Gayton whistled. <whistles> what makes you think that? he said. Dunning told of his conversation with the museum assistant, and Gayton could only agree that the guess seemed likely to be correct. Not that I care much, Dunning went on. Only it might be a nuisance if we were to meet. He's a bad-tempered party, I imagine. Conversation dropped again. Gayton become... Gayton became more and more strongly impressed with the desolateness that came over Dunning's face and bearing. And finally, though with a considerable effort, he asked him, point blank, whether something serious was not bothering him. Dunning gave an exclamation of relief. I was perishing to get it off my mind, he said. Do you know anything about a man named John Harrington? Gayton was thoroughly startled, and at the moment could only ask why. Then the complete story of Dunning's experiences came out. What had happened in the tram car, in his own house, and in the street. The troubling of spirit that had crept over him, and still held him. And he ended with the question he had begun with. Gayton was at a loss how to answer him. To tell the story of Harrington's end would perhaps be right, only Dunning was in a nervous state. The story was a grim one and he could not help asking himself whether there were not a connecting link between these two cases in the person of Carswell. It was a difficult concession for a scientific man, but it could be eased by the phrase hypnotic suggestion. In the end, he decided that his answer tonight should be guarded. He would talk the situation over with his wife. So he said that he had known Harrington at Cambridge and believed he had died suddenly in 1889, adding a few details about the man and his published work. He did talk over the matter with Mrs Gayton and, as he had anticipated, she leapt at once to the conclusion which had been hovering before him. It was she who reminded him of the surviving brother, Henry Harrington, and she also who suggested that he might be got hold of by means of their hosts of the day before. He might be a hopeless crank, objected Gayton, that could be ascertained from the Bennets who knew him, Mrs Gayton retorted, and she undertook to see the Bennets the very next day. 
It is not necessary to tell in further detail the steps by which Henry Harrington and Dunning were brought together. Let's take a break there. What do we think? Let me know what you think so far, folks. I think that this story, and I could see in my peripheral vision, the chat going absolutely wild at the extreme horrifying left turn that was the mouthful of teeth under his pillow. And that is actually why I think I keep coming back to these MR James stories, because they lull you into that false sense of security massively massively because it's just this academic so 10 things tend to happen in the daytime it's just like posh people having lunch basically and then just suddenly from nowhere mouth mouth under the pillow and it's exactly what mr james does well i think it's something that's described very lightly the way he writes the description of the mouth is very sparing. But I don't know about you folks, but I can picture that mouth exactly. And it's horrible. Mm -hmm. Elisha Melia says, the hell was the mouth under the pillow all about? Yeah. Claire T says, why would you ruin pillows like that story? Pillows are great. Yeah. Um, that's the thing about it, because when you're in bed, when you are lying in bed, what do you do? You just, as you're just do dozing off, you just, almost unconsciously, your hand just reaches under your pillow, doesn't it? And that's how it happens. You, you know, like, maybe you're just trying to, like, I sleep on my side, and, you know, I, I just reach my hand under there. I like to, I, you know, I sleep like this. I just like to sort of hand under the pillow, just propping it up. Sometimes you might just be reaching it under there just to, like, flip the pillow, you know, to get the nice cool side. Everyone likes the cool side of the pillow. And I know what I'm going to be thinking about next time. And I know I'm not going to think about it in time to stop my hand going under the pillow. It's just going to be, as it goes in, I'll be like, mouth, 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 mouth. But there won't be a mouth. Because ghosts aren't real. And creepy mouths under your pillow aren't real. Unless you put it there on purpose or something. In which case, you know what? Live your life. I'm going to read the description of the mouth again because that's the, that's, that's, the kind, that's the kind of person I am, I guess. Fran Fry says, let's all check our pillows tonight. Yes, let's. If you think it'll help. Okay, yeah, so let's find, let's find that description again because... Ugh, horrible. More than once in my home... Oh, and the, that's the other thing I like. That they're so um, they're so un. How to describe it? The horrors in M. R. James's short stories are so like non-traditional. Like, what is the sign? What is the number one sign that you're being haunted? It's like the air goes cold, right? Like that's like, you know, the chill or something. But here, in, this is described, he's in, he's, he's, you know, hanging out in the corridor. And what's this? A hot, a gust of warm or hot air. And there's something about that that is so much worse. It's like breath. Breath from the mouth. I'll read the description. This is so few words, but you know what it looks like in your mind. What he touched was, according to his account, a mouth with teeth and with hair about it. And he declares, not the mouth of a human being. Mm. <laughs> Horrible. Yeah. John Sharplin says, I agree. Hot air indicates life and intent to me. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. It's like... Mm. It is creepy. It is creepy, folks. But you know what? It's a ghost story. We want, we want creepy. <laughs> the chat is not happy with me for reading it again. But you know, some, some good bit of the story. Got to read it again. 
You gotta. I gotta. I got. Look, I'm bound. I'm bound to. What am I? What am I gonna do? Not read out the creepy bits twice. Abundance of cats says thanks for that, Luke. Definitely needed that reminder. What can I say? What can I say? All right, let's crack on. How am I doing with my port? I'm doing well. Hmm. Why did I wait so long to introduce port to these streams? It's just such a nice way to like cap off each section. All right. Let's crack on. Brace yourself, folks. It is not necessary to tell in further detail the steps by which Henry Harrington and Dunning were brought together. The next scene that does require to be narrated is a conversation that took place between the two. Dunning had told Harrington of the strange ways in which the dead man's name had been brought before him, and had said something besides of his own subsequent experiences. Then he had asked if Harrington was disposed in return to recall any of the circumstances connected with his brother's death. Harrington's surprise at what he heard can be imagined, but his reply was readily given. John, he said, was in a very odd state, undeniably from time to time, during some weeks before, though not immediately before the catastrophe. And there were several things. The, the principal notion he had was that he thought he was being followed. No doubt he was an impressionable man, but he never had had such fancies as this before. I cannot get it out of my mind that there was ill will at work. And what you tell me about yourself reminds me very much of my brother. Can you think of any possible connecting link? There is just one that has been taking shape vaguely in my mind. I've been told that your brother reviewed a book very severely not long before he died. And just lately I have happened to cross the path of the man who wrote that book in a way he would resent. Don't tell me the man was named Carswell. Why not? That, that is exactly his name. Henry Harrington leant back. That is final to my mind. Now, I, m I must explain further. From something he said, I feel sure that my brother John was beginning to believe, very much against his will, that Carswell was at the bottom of his trouble. I want to tell you what seems to me to have a bearing on the situation. My brother was a great musician and used to run up to concerts in town. He came back three months before he died from one of these and gave me his programme to look at, an analytical programme he always kept them. I nearly missed this one, he said. I suppose I must have dropped it. Anyhow, I was looking for it under my seat and in my pockets and so on, and my neighbour offered me his, and might he give it me, he had no further use for it, and he went away just afterwards. I don't know who he was, a stout, clean-shaven man. I should have been sorry to miss it, of course I could have not bought another, but this cost me nothing. Well, and another time he told me that he had been very uncomfortable both on the way to his hotel and during the night. I piece things together now in thinking it's over. Then, not very long after, he was going over these programmes, putting them in order to have them bound up, and in this particular one, which, by the way, I had hardly glanced at, he found quite near the beginning a strip of paper with some very odd writing on it, in red and black. Most carefully done. It seemed to me more like runic letters than anything else. Why, he said, this must belong to my fat neighbour. It looks as if it might be worth returning to him. It may be a copy of something. Evidently someone has taken trouble over it. How can I find his address? Well, we talked it over for a little and agreed that it wasn't worth advertising about and that my brother had better look out for the man at the next concert, to which he was going very soon. The paper was lying on the book and we were both by the fire. It was a cold windy summer evening. I suppose the door blew open, though I, I didn't notice it. At any rate, a gust, a warm gust it was, came quite suddenly between us, took the paper and blew it straight into the fire. It was a thin light paper and it flared up and went up the chimney in a single ash. Well, I said, you can't give it back now. He said nothing for a minute, then rather crossly, no, I can't, but why you should keep on saying so, I don't know. I remarked that I didn't say it more than once. Not more than four times, you mean, was all he said. I remember all that very clearly, without any good reason. And now to come to the point, 
I don't know if you looked at that book of Carswell's, which my unfortunate brother reviewed. It's not likely that you should, but I did, both before his death and after it. The first time we made a game of it together, it was written in no style at all, split infinitives and every sort of thing that makes an Oxford gorge rise. Then there was nothing that the man didn't swallow, mixing up classical myths and stories out of the golden legend with, with reports of savage customs of today. All very proper, no doubt, if you know how to use them, but he didn't. He seemed to put the golden legend and the golden bow exactly on a par, and to believe both. A pitiable exhibition, in short. Well, after the misfortune, I looked over the book again. It was no better than before, but the impression which it left this time on my mind was... different. I suspected, as I told you, that, that Carswell had borne ill will to my brother, even that he was in some way responsible for what had happened. And now his book seemed to me to be a very sinister performance indeed. One chapter in particular struck me in which he spoke of casting the runes on people, either for the purpose of gaining their affection or of getting them out of the way, perhaps more especially the latter. He spoke of all this in a way that really seemed to me to imply actual knowledge. I've not time to go into details, but the upshot is that I'm pretty sure from information received that the civil man at the concert was Carswell. I suspect, I more than suspect, that the paper was of importance. And I do believe that if my brother had been able to give it back, he might have been alive now. Therefore it occurs to me to ask whether you have anything to put beside what I have told you. Well, by way of answer, Dunning had the episode in the manuscript room at the British Library to relate. Then did he actually hand you some papers? Have you examined them? No, because we must, if you'll allow it, look at them at once, and very carefully. They went to the still empty house, empty for the two servants were not yet able to return to work. Dunning's portfolio of papers was gathering dust on the writing table. In it were the quires of small-sized scribbling paper which he used for his transcripts, and from one of these, as he took it up, there slipped and fluttered out into the room with uncanny quickness a strip of thin, light paper. The window was open, but Harrington slammed it too, just in time to intercept the paper, which he caught. I thought so, he said. It might be the identical thing that was given to my brother. You'll have to look out, Dunning. This may mean something quite serious for you. A long consultation took place. The paper was narrowly examined. As Harrington had said, the characters on it were more like runes than anything else but not decipherable by either man, and both hesitated to copy them, for fear, as they confessed, of perpetuating whatever evil purpose they might conceal. So it has remained impossible, if I may anticipate a little, to ascertain what was conveyed in this curious message or commission. Both Dunning and Harrington are firmly convinced that it had the effect of bringing its possessors into very undesirable company, that it must be returned to the source whence it came, they were agreed, and further, that the only safe and certain way was that of personal service. And here contrivance would be necessary, for Dunning was known by sight to Carswell. He must, for one thing, alter his appearance by shaving his beard. But then, might not the blow fall first? Harrington thought they could time it. He knew the date of the concert at which the black spot had been put on his brother. It was June 18th. The death had followed on September 18th. Dunning reminded him that the three months had been mentioned on the inscription on the car window. Perhaps, he added with a cheerless laugh, mine may be a bill at three months too. I believe I can fix it by my diary. Yes, yes, April 23rd was the day at the museum. That brings us to July 23rd. Now, you know, it becomes extremely important to me to know anything you will tell me about the progress of your brother's trouble, if it is possible for you to speak of it. Of course. Well, uh, the sense of being watched whenever he was alone was the most distressing thing to him. After a time, I took to sleeping in his room. And he was the better for that, still he talked a great deal in his sleep. What about... Is it wise to dwell on that, uh, at least before things are straightened out? Uh, I think not, but, but I can tell you this. Two things came for him by post during those weeks, bo both with a London postmark and addressed in a commercial hand. One was a woodcut of Bewick's, roughly torn out of the page, 
one which shows a moonlit road and a man walking along it, followed by an awful demon creature. Under it were written the lines out of the ancient mariner, which I suppose the cut illustrates, about one who, having looked round, walks on and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. The other was a calendar, such as tradesmen often send. My brother paid no attention to this, but I looked at it after his death, and found that everything after September 18th had been torn out. You may be surprised at his having gone out alone the evening he was killed, but the fact is that during the last ten days or so of his life, he had been quite free from the sense of being followed or watched. The end of the consultation was this. Harrington, who knew a neighbour of Carswell's, thought he saw a way of keeping a watch on his movements. It would be Dunning's part to be in readiness to try to cross Carswell's path at any moment to keep the paper safe and in a place of ready access. Let's take a break there before we read the final part, I think. Hmm, how about the woodcut of the demon creature? And from the rhyme of the ancient mariner, let's hear let's hear that bit of uh, bit of that passage again. Uh, the man who, having once looked round, walks on and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. Now that is really creepy. Yep. Demons, awful demon creature. Something that I think, something that I find unsettling about about this story or about what is happening is the variety and inconsistency of weird ill omens that Carswell appears to be sort of sending down upon people who he tries to, um, you know, people who, he, people who he's cursed, I think we can safely say at this point. Like, there's this calendar with all the days after the day of death torn out. An advert that you see in a car, which has like, like mystic stuff. Then there's the actual piece of paper that has runes on it, which has to be sort of given secretly. Then there's the hot gusts of air. Then there's the hand. Oh, huh? the the pillow hand. That's a big one. That's a big one. But it's just so. It's just so like such a scatter shot cursing it's like throw every throw every sinister omen curse at the wall and and see what sticks it's cool though okay imladra d says Carswell has too much time on his hands. And Tory248 says, Someone did not learn to take rejection well. Yeah. I would say Carswell is taking rejection very badly. Especially, like, look. I think anyone with a career in the writing field, um, you know, I was... I, I was I I worked as a, as, a, as, a, as a writer, as a reporter for many years. I think anyone who works in the field... I think you have to become very much accustomed to a certain level of rejection because not everyone is going to publish you. You know, you've got to get a slightly thick skin about that kind of thing. So how Carswell has failed to develop that, I don't know, ma'am. I don't know, but Carswell is not prepared for a bad review. Vivian... Uh, Sasa Duran says, can't we all just agree that Carswell is an amazing prankster? <laughs> Ama yeah, I mean, it, it's an amazing prank until the point where, like, a demon chases you up a tree and you die. At that point, <laughs> can we all agree the prank has gone too far when a demon chases you up a tree and you die? Up to that point, it's all fun and games. We all like a laugh. But when a demon chases you up a tree and you fall out and you die... Folks, the laughter stops. It has to. It just has to. Right. Okay. John Burnham says, I work in academia and curse people almost every day. 
Little Natural D has a great comment here. You only need that thick skin if you don't know how to curse the critics. That's right. Yeah. Alex Samara says maybe these uh, were the first two things he'd ever tried to publish and was so full of himself that he didn't expect rejection. Privileged rich dude tries to take up writing, not ready for criticism. Yeah, um... I think that sounds pretty on the money. Alex Samaras, I think you've nailed it. As you often do. Yeah, full of himself, didn't expect rejection. Also, and again, I'm not siding with Carswell here, didn't necessarily deserve rejection, because as we say, his magic works. He's written an actual magic book of magic spells, and he's trying to publish. I mean, it's a good job it didn't get published, or else everyone would be, you know... If he just waits, he can publish it, like, on... A, it can be a Kindle ebook, And then anyone can do spells. Okay. Folks. It's time to bring it home. Strap in. Who's going to live? Who's going to die? Let's find out. They parted. The next weeks were no doubt a severe strain upon Dunning's nerves. The intangible barrier which had seemed to rise about him on the day when he received the paper gradually developed into a brooding blackness that cut him off from the means of escape to which one might have thought he might resort. No one was at hand who was likely to suggest them to him, and he seemed robbed of all initiative. He waited with inexpressible anxiety as May... June and early July passed on for a mandate from Harrington, but all this time Carswell remained immovable at Lufford. At last, in less than a week before the date he had come to look upon as the end of his earthly activities, came a telegram. Leaves Victoria by boat train Thursday night. Do not miss. I come to you tonight, Harrington. He arrived accordingly and they concocted plans. The train left Victoria at nine and its last stop before Dover was Croydon West. Harrington would mark down Carswell at Victoria and look out for Dunning at Croydon, calling to him, if need were, by a name agreed upon. Dunning, disguised as far as might be, was to have no label or initials on any hand luggage and must at all costs have the paper with him. Dunning's suspense as he waited on the Croydon platform, I need not attempt to describe. His sense of danger during the last days had only been sharpened by the fact that the cloud about him had perceptibly been lighter. But relief was an ominous symptom, and if Carswell eluded him now, hope was gone, and there were so many chances of that. The rumour of the journey might be itself a device. The twenty minutes in which he paced the platform and persecuted every porter with inquiries as to the boat train were as bitter as any he had spent. Still, the train came, and Harrington was at the window. It was important, of course, that there should be no recognition, so Dunning got in at the farther end of the cor corridor carriage and only gradually made his way to the compartment where Harrington and Carswell were. He was pleased, on the whole, to see that the train was far from full. Carswell was on the alert, but gave no sign of recognition. Dunning took the seat not immediately facing him, and attempted, vainly at first, then with increasing command of his faculties, to reckon the possibilities of making the desired transfer. Opposite to Carswell, and next to Dunning, was a heap of Carswell's coats on the seat. It would be of no use to slip the paper into these. He would not be safe, or would not feel so, unless in some way it could be proffered to him and accepted, proffered by him and accepted by the other. There was a handbag open and with papers in it. Could he manage to conceal this, so that perhaps Carswell might leave the carriage without it, and then find and give it to him? Well, this was the plan that suggested itself. If he could only have counselled with Harrington, but that could not be. The minutes went on. More than once, Carswell rose and went out into the corridor. The second time, Dunning was on the point of attempting to make the bag fall off the seat, but he caught Harrington's eye and read in it a warning. 
Carswell from the corridor was watching, probably to see if the two men recognised each other. He returned, but was evidently restless. And when he rose the third time, hope dawned, for something did slip off his seat and fall with hardly a sound to the floor. Carswell went out once more and passed out of range of the corridor window. Dunning picked up what had fallen and saw that the key was in his hands in the form of one of Cook's ticket cases with tickets in it. These cases have a pocket in the cover, and within very few seconds, the paper of which we have heard was in the pocket of this one. To make the operation more secure, Harrington stood in the doorway of the compartment and fiddled with the blind. It was done, and done at the right time, for the train was now slowing down towards Dover. In a moment, in a moment more, Carswell re-entered the compartment. As he did so, Dunning, managing he knew not how to suppress the tremble in his voice, handed him the ticket case, saying, May I give you this, sir? I believe it is yours. After a brief glance at the ticket inside, Carswell uttered the hoped-for response. Yes, it is. I'm much obliged to you, sir. And he placed it in his breast pocket. Even in the few minutes that remained, moments of tense anxiety, for they knew not to what a premature finding of the paper might lead, both men noticed that the carriage seemed to darken about them and to grow warmer, that Carswell was fidgety and oppressed, that he drew the heap of loose coats near to him and, and cast it back as if it repelled him, and that he then sat upright and glanced anxiously at both. They, with sickening anxiety, busied themselves in collecting their belongings, but they both thought that Carswell was on the point of speaking when the train stopped at Dover Town. It was natural that in the short space between town and pier they should both go into the corridor. At the pier they got out, but so empty was the train that they were forced to linger on the platform until Carswell should have passed ahead of them with his porter on the way to the boat, and only then was it safe for them to exchange a pressure of the hand and a word of concentrated congratulation. The effect upon Dunning was to make him almost faint. Harrington made him lean up against the wall while he himself went a few yards within sight of the gangway to the boat, at which Carswell had now arrived. The man at the head of it examined his ticket and, laden with coats, he passed down into the boat. Suddenly the official called after him, You, sir, beg pardon. Did the other gentleman show his ticket? What the devil do you mean by the other gentleman? Carswell's snarling voice called back from the deck. The man bent over and looked at him. The devil? Well, I don't know, I'm sure, Harrington heard him say to himself, and then aloud, My mistake, sir, must have been your rugs, ask your pardon. And then to a subordinate near him, Had he got a dog with him, or what? Funny thing, I could have swore he wasn't alone. Well, whatever it was, they'll have to see to it aboard. She's off now. Another week and we should be getting the holiday customers. In five minutes more, there was nothing but the lessening lights of the boat, the long line of the Dover lamps, the night breeze, and the moon. Long and long, the two sat in their room at the Long Warden. In spite of the removal of their greatest anxiety, they were oppressed with a doubt not of the lightest. Had they been justified in sending a man to his death as they believed they had? Ought they not to warn him at least? No said Harrington. If he is the murderer, I think him. We have done more than is just. Still, if you think it better... But but how and where can you warn him? He was booked to Abbeville only. I saw that, said Dunning. If I wired to the hotels there in Joanne's guide, examine your ticket case, Dunning. Examine your ticket case, Dunning. I should feel happier. This is the 21st. He will have a day. But I'm afraid he's gone into the dark. So telegrams were left at the hotel office. It is not clear whether these reached their destination or whether, if they did, they were understood. All that is known is that, on the afternoon of the 23rd, an English traveller, examining the front of St Wolfram's Church at Abbeville, then under extensive repair, was struck on the head and instantly killed by a stone falling from the scaffold erected round the northwestern tower there being, as was clearly proved, no workman on the scaffold at that moment. 
and the traveller's papers identified him as Mr Carswell. Only one detail shall be added. At Carswell's sale, a set of Bewick sold with all faults was acquired by Harrington. The page with the woodcut of the traveller and the demon was, as he had expected, mutilated. Also, after a judicious interval, Harrington repeated to Dunning something of what he had heard his brother say in his sleep. But it was not long before Dunning stopped him. And that is the end. And that is the end. There you go. They got him, folks. They bagged him. They bagged Carswell. The cursor becomes the cursee. Fancy Space Owl says, wait, did the good guys win? Yeah. Yeah. And this I like, because I think it speaks to the tone of this last section. John Chaplin says, didn't know that MR James was just a pen name of John le Carré. <laughs> mm. Mm. That last section has such spy vibes. Just the tension of like trying to slip the paper to the thing. And, you know, and the train it feels really tense. Is it going to work? Is there something there's something very um, stressful to imagine about being in that situation where you have to like get this thing in? You have to give someone something without them recognizing you and they have to accept it and they have to take it from you gratefully. And you're doing that and you and the plan has been hatched with someone else who is also on the train. But you can't talk to that person. Just the idea of Dunning and Harrington like just sat on the train. <laughs> just like ignoring each other you know just maybe like just little furtive glances yeah and then a few a few creepy touches at the end like Carswell getting on the boat and the you know the person taking his ticket saying that they're like some it seemed like they thought that someone else had got on with him I thought it was also interesting that apparently like giving the curse back uh, like doesn't start the three month countdown to death over again because you know it seemed to very much be like oh well you know I've only got like one day until I die so if I give this to you now you die in one day and that seems to be how it worked it was a little um you know that was fortunate or else Carswell could have completed his um trip to Abbeville come back and had a lot longer to notice also he should have well, I think with more time as well he would have been able to identify you know, all of the signs of the curses that he puts on people. He should know the symptoms, really, shouldn't he? And just finally, and let me know in the chat, what did you think of this one? Let me know what you thought of the story. Just finally, the... the um, That ending is good. That's a good last line. Harrington repeated to Dunning something of what he had heard his brother say in his sleep. This is the brother Harrington who was cursed and for three months and then died repeated to him something of what he had heard his brother say in his sleep, but it was not long before Dunning stopped him. That's so creepy, and it's so good, and it's so much better. You know that, like, um, I think it was Stephen King said that thing about, like, the, 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 the monster once revealed is, like, it's never going to be as scary as it was in, in your mind. It's got something of that vibe to it. Unless, of course, the thing that, um, you're describing is a non-human mouth full of hair and teeth under your pillow in that situation yeah that's creepier than anything you can imagine so it's not always as straightforward as it seems oh great we've got um thank you all love um thanks for the, the the comments and the and the super chats coming in that's real appreciated Gentle Mandrill says, whoa, they really got him? Wasn't expecting that. Thank you, Luke, for always doing these streams. I love them so much. I would totally buy Luke audiobooks. Like, for real, your voices are the best. Thank you. Although, if I was doing the audiobook, it's probably frowned upon if you're doing an audiobook to just, like, stop and talk about it and be like, oh, my God, do you think they're going to get him? I think they're going to get him. <laughs> it's like ongoing director's commentary. I think that would probably be frowned upon. Um... Also, probably not drinking port as you read the audiobooks. That's probably viewed as unprofessional. Elijah Ramirez says, can this be Final Destination, but in the Victorian times? Yeah, it kind of is. It kind of is. Fran Fry um, says, this one was so weird, but in a real good way. 
And Amadeus121, thank you very much, says, Thank you for the story, Luke. One of the best so far. Yeah, I like this one. You know, it goes a lot of places, this one. It's got more, it's got a kind of... um. I don't want to say romp, because that makes it sound way too lighthearted and fun. But there's something about the fact that it's like... You know, we it's got so many characters. Probably the most characters we've had in one story. Because you've got, like, all the people, like, at some society party discussing Carswell. You've got Carswell. You've got his, like, horrible children's party <laughs> with all the centipedes. And then you've got... Um, and, you know, and, and the story just moves around. You've got the, the, the sort of the sick servants. You've got um, George and William on the tram. Um, you know, like Harrington, who ends up being like super important, is only introduced kind of like I think past the halfway point. It's got a sort of um, John Le Carre was a really good comparison. I love Le Carre novels. Um, it, it, he's like a if if you're not if you're not familiar, I, I suspect many of you are. Um, it's like a, he 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 wrote um. He, he wrote Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy is probably his most famous book because of the film it was adapted into. But all of the the, the George Smiley um, sort of like series of like Cold War spy things are so unbelievably good and gripping and, and, and exciting and like that kind of twisty turny spy versus spy thing. It's brilliant. Um, oh, David Badalotti, thank you very much um, uh, for the gift. A little fox cuddling a trophy. That's nice. Nimble Tax says this one was really good. Lots of characters and lots of tension. Sophie Fieldhouse says proper good, this one. Jan Stenall says bloody amazing. That's cool. It seems like everyone was into this one. I wasn't so sure if everybody would be. Um, because it doesn't have... Um, it doesn't have so much horror. Like, when I read it, I was like, you know what? It's got a kind of, sort of, almost a kind of, like... I don't know, like a kind of Da Vinci Code, kind of like, it's a chase around the country. Can we do this? Can we meet this person? Can we get the information? Can we pass over the details? And it's only really got a couple of instances of actual haunting. The most horrible of which being the pillow mouth. But I think that the pillow mouth is enough. It's enough. It's a, You know what? I don't even need to finish that sentence. It's It's just enough. It's enough for this story. Charlotte Winner, thank you so much, says, thank you for another great spooky stream. These and all the other Oxbox streams have been so helpful in distracting me from mental health stuff. I'm only sad I've had to return to work this week and can't often watch live anymore. Charlotte Winwood, um, so very happy to hear that these streams help somewhat in that capacity. These streams help with my own um, mental health stuff, as you as you put it. Um, uh, yeah, and I hope returning to work has been, has been all right. Um... Yeah, it, we're at an interesting phase, aren't we, of this whole um, lockdown pandemic situation um, where, you know, now it's this kind of like slow, quite anxious, I'm finding, kind of grinding, uncertain sort of tr like attempt to return to normalcy. You, you want to return to normalcy, but you, but you get the sense that like, the, the, you know, the, the x th this this th such and such thing feels like it's moving too fast that like should we really be doing this kind of thing we're told that we can but like should we i don't know i don't it doesn't it doesn't feel right um it's it's a real confuse a real difficult time and um and i think it probably shouldn't catch us by surprise that coming out that's very agonizingly slowly coming out the other side of this very very weird period is um it's just as stressful and and uh, and as uh, and as upsetting as as being plunged into it was. Uh, right, that's that's a digression. We don't need to. We don't need to. We don't need to dwell, do we? Look, like like we haven't all spent plenty of time thinking about and talking about the situation. Capital T, capital S. Jane Clue. It says thanks, Luke. Um, also, everyone watch the film of this. It's called Night of the Demon, and it's great. I had no idea there was a film. Thank you, Jane Cluett. Thank you for the super chat, but thank you also for that film recommendation. Let's look it up right now. Uh, Night of the Demon. Ooh, ooh, ooh. 1957 British horror film. Adapted from Casting the Runes. Uh, wow. Wow. Wow, I mean, I'm looking at the... You know what? Open, crack, like, fire open a new tab. You know what? You know what? Actually, don't even bother. I'll just pop I'll just pop this uh, link in the chat. 
um, check out this poster. Just put a link to that in the chat. Um, what I will say is this. If, uh, if the film adheres closely to the book, then that poster is seriously overselling the amount of, like, visible demon haunting that you're going to get. <laughs> because it was quite an understated, you know, in terms of actual hauntings and stuff. Um, Angela Sanchez, thank you very much, says, The mouth was pretty gross, for sure, but it was never described what it was attached to, which just makes the whole thing a million times worse. Thanks for the great read, as always. Angela Sanchez, I had not even considered the thought of the mouth being attached to something. In my mind, it was a loose mouth. It was a mouth just by itself. Snappy, snappy, snap. And it wasn't attached to anything. There was no digestive tract. But now, as you say that, Angela Sanchez, you've made it quite clear that, of course, what an assumption that is to make. Why would you assume that it's not attached to anything? It could be attached to a horrible werewolf. Oh, it could be attached to one of the horrible hairy demons from one of the other stories we read. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Hard pass. MX underscore Tay says, Angela Sanchez, why would you say that? <laughs> yeah. Have to agree. Have to agree. Um. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> So, Kobe Morris says that makes it worse. Why would why would it be free floating? Is free float is 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 a loose mouth worse, or is it worse if it's attached to something? I don't know. They're both bad. Can we just agree they're both bad? <laughs> Laura Dealey says makes me wonder if the three month thing was a deadline. Could the demon mouth kill him before the three months? Yeah, maybe the demon mouth is like me with sort of every school and university assignment I ever had where it's, you know, yeah, you've got three months to kill Harrington, but I'm not going to do it like now. I'm going to work up to it. And then the night before, the demon will frantically cram Harrington's hand into its mouth. <laughs> Sorry, I'm amusing myself here. Right, well. Folks, thank you so much for being along with this reading. This was another really fun one. I love doing these. Um, I don't actually have a next story queued up. So if you want to, uh, like, tweet me um, or, you know, message me on Instagram or anything, like, sort of, I, I, I probably won't be able to directly respond, so apologies, but, like, but I, I do look, I love taking recommendations. So many of the stories that we've read have been recommendations. This one was a recommendation. This was a recommendation from, um, um, from Dan in the chat, who also suggested The Judge's House, which was the last one we read. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you, if you, if you are familiar with any old-timey really really sort of gripping short stories maybe from from new authors we haven't done yet or, or maybe from you know that like most all of the all the authors who we've read they've written a lot you know so there's no sh there's no shortage of stuff but i do like i do like a personal recommendation um cool well yeah let me know let me know um and i'll i'll, I'll look some stuff up Good suggestions coming in in the chat. I'm not gonna read. I'm not gonna read them aloud because I don't want to make any. I don't want to make too many promises. But uh, yep, that one. That one's on my. That one's on my list. I've read that one. I've read that one, and it's brilliant. I'm saving that one for a special occasion. Right. This doesn't make any sense to anyone except me, unless you're reading the chat. Thank you so much for watching, folks. I really appreciate this. I really appreciate all of your comments and what and everybody watching along. Um. See you next time. And until then, may I just beg you to remain unhaunted. Goodbye.